why the DRA is interested in ancient technology and material use from a culture that's been here for more than 10,000 years is to understand human connection to the landscape and to renew it in any way that we can find to do so. And it's important for youth and all of us to, to find ways to connect to the landscape. I got involved in this project through David Moses Bridges, who's had a pretty long-term association with the Denmark Scotter River Association, um, and uh, he's done a number of projects with them. We had also talked about this canoe project since, well, that time and, and before, so this has been a long time uh, being planned, and um, unfortunately, uh, David passed away last uh, January uh, from cancer, and you know, it's, it's a sad occasion, but he did want us to keep keep going with this project without him if it came to that, and so that's what we're doing. Mark is just unrolled flat on the building bed. Then the gunnel frame is laid on that. Um, holes have been drilled previously for the stakes around the gunnel frame, and then the stakes are put into those holes, and that's what holds the sides up. But you have to use heat as you bend the bark to allow it to fold like that. So there's a lot of different parts. It's kind of a, a, a planning process. You have to plan way ahead with each step, kind of like a chess game, really. Mm -hmm. You plan way in advance. And hopefully, if it all works out, you know, things work out the way you had planned. But there's, there's some parts of it that, even with all the planning, it just seems like something that, something magical about it that's, that's uh, beyond what any human could really imagine because mm -hmm. the, the materials are so beautiful. This is summer bark that's, that's peeled during the month of July. Um, we also use what's called winter bark, which is peeled in early spring, generally in, in uh, early May. And uh, that comes off with a, a brown layer, so it's, um, it, it actually is harder to peel at that time, it's stuck tight to the tree. But that brown layer can be sc scraped into with a knife and you can etch designs into it by exposing the, the light color underneath. Uh, it's the primary tool for canoe building, bridge bark canoe building. The gathering of the materials involves the uh, gathering of the birch bark, the cedar for the woodwork, uh, which cedar is what you use for the gunnels, the ribs, and the planking, um, and the uh, forts or maple, so various materials that you gather from the woods, um, and then there's a lot of time involved in um, splitting that, and it's, you know, because we're not really sawing it out, and splitting it so that it follows the grain. Um, cedar is uh, known for its splitting properties. It's, uh, you can split it very accurately. So um, it's the traditional wood to use for that. It also bends very well, so you can bend the ribs, and it makes a smooth bend with hot water. Uh, so all that cedar has to be uh, carved and smooth and shaped, and that's, that takes quite a lot of preparation as well. You lay the, the gunnel frame, which is the, the gunnels with the thwarts mortised in, um, which will eventually be the top frame of the canoe. But first, we're using it as a frame uh, a form for the bottom to shape the bottom around that frame. And that's what we're doing now. We, we've, shaped, we've folded up the bark around it, and we're um, adding in pieces where we need to to add to the, the height of the bark so that it'll reach the gunnels because. Um, in most cases, the, the bark isn't wide enough to reach the gunnels in the middle without piecing it out. So then the ribs and the planking go in last. So they're they're added in to shape the bark, and they stretch it around it to the shape of the canoe. Right now, it's all very straight and square, but later it'll be rounded by the ribs. One unbroken piece on the bottom, and, and it would be unbroken on the sides as well, except that you have to cut it into gores so that it doesn't pucker. You have to take up the slack as it bends up by um, cutting gores that overlap, and that overlap is thin so that it won't make a bulge. And then the edge is sewn with a few stitches to hold everything in place. These are spruce roots that have been boiled and peeled, and, and these ones have been split. Uh, th these are actually uh, the size that we'll use for lashing the gunnels. There's some smaller ones in here that we'll use for the sewing of the seams. So they start, the first pulled up.
But these little sticks are for to determine the shear of the boat. So if you can see this stick, it, the bark comes up further than this stick, so we're going to have to trim some of this bark down. Um, so basically this is to show where the gunnels are going to go, oh. where everything's going to line up, and that's where, not the water line, but the, basically the edges of the boat will be. We're making side panels. These are the pieces that are added in for the width on the sides. Smooth it up, clean it up. This part will be added on, yeah. And yeah. It will be decorated, but primarily it's to get height, to get more width on the sides. So we're just feathering the edges to reduce weight and reduce bulkiness and overlap. Making an inch about like this to a point that's three inches below the gunnel line. So yeah, you can sort of extract weight from oh yeah, you have the gunnel line there. So yeah, three inches down. The grain line is about where we want it now, so if anything I would take more off this end. These are the battens for the um, the stitch, the sewing that we're going to do. These are the outlets in here. These battens, these are just uh, they're called fairing battens. They just uh, keep the bark in a fair curve between the stakes so that it's not you know going in and out between the stakes. It's an even pressure. Pressure supplied by the stakes to clamp it. want to preserve that position. If you put your all holes right next to the batten, you can gradually shove it up over the course of your seam, and, and that's what we don't want to happen. We want to allow enough room so that the, there's a little bit of bark showing above the batten, just because that way the batten won't, you know, drift up and lose its uh, function. You have to remember that the point where you uh, first start the all it's not the point where the outside edge is going to end up because it's going to expand as it goes in, as it gets bigger. So you can allow for that. As we sew along, when we come to a set of pegs, just plan your stitches so that the, the, your next your stitch there will actually use those same holes. You space it so that it comes out right. And our spacing of the stitches is going to be, say, three eighths to a half inch. And again, try not to hit the eyes. And so that could affect the spacing and the stitching a little bit. It doesn't have to be an exact even stitching, but you want to be close to even. Tobias here is doing what's called a back stitch, which is where you go forward and back. The root has to be kept wet at, uh, because when you pull it through the hole in the bark, that squeezes water out. Plus the air dries it out as you go. So if it dries out too much, it'll break. Uh, the batten stitch. This root here that I'm sewing over is a, it's a batten root. And that's to, uh, it allows you to bear down really tightly on the joint without splitting the, the bark. Because we're sewing in the direction of the grain, so it's a little bit weaker in that direction. So I'm able to put a good amount of force on that. And on the inside, you get that nice diagonal pattern, and on the outside, the nice square. Weight was holding the gunnels down on, on the bark, and uh, we had to take the weight off to raise the gunnels and put them on posts. And then we put some of the weight back to hold the gunnels into the proper curve, which is the, the line of what's called the shear, which is 
the rise of the gunnels towards the end. We're slashing the uh, out whale to the inside of the gunnel right now. It seems like a much stronger yeah. Nice and tight. But it, is it, would it just be too hard to lash overall? Here, and then you'll do a lashing here. There's a peg here, it and do a lashing here, so there's every other one. For, after all these lashings around, we'll put a cap over it. And so the top face will be covered, and you'll just be able to see the sides here. And then we'll put another peg like what's here on top, and that'll hold the cap on top. It has to be lashed solidly along the gunnel so, and lash and peg so that the joint of the gunnel to the bark can withstand the force of the ribs. Just creating a space uh, so I can <coughs> tuck the root back under. That's just how you end the lashing. Uh, on this end I'm going to just give the, the bark a pre-trim before we even do the fold. That'll make the fold easier. That's allowing about a couple inches beyond where the stem is going to be. So about, about that far away from the stem. And clamp that clamp it. to hold it steady so okay. that things don't shift around. Yep. And also the stem piece itself has to be held steady in the middle. A chip knife like this in a V. Go real slow and don't uh, cut down into the, the cloth. Right. So right. all of this is coming off, right? Yep. All of that. Yep. Yeah. Right down into there. Okay. Yep. And get it to where it's pretty solid against the um, stem piece. So. So the V should be up in here. Yeah. Somewhere. line. We've leveled the horses, so we're trying to get the ends straight. Now that line was established by when the canoe was right side up, dropping a plumb line from the, the notch where the end whales come together to the bottom and marking it on the inside of the bottom. And then that mark was transferred to the outside, uh, a reference point for where the uh, stem pieces go to and they'll go about a half inch in from that. Etching the winter bark. Um, so I'm just removing the outer layer um, that, that you get when you harvest winter bark. You can wet it and really easily etch different designs into it. And then this is called the double curve, and it's a traditional Wabanaki symbol. And Steve designed it with um, some leaves, which is a motif that. Be seen. It's also mortise and tenoned and pegged into the gunnels, so it's it's a really crucial joint. A lot of the all the outward force of the ribs is pushing the gunnels out. We're getting ready to put the ribs in the canoe, and uh, it's been put on those shavings so that the uh, the ribs can change the shape of the bottom. It's going to get rounded out. Um, and uh, also the shavings will hold the, the moisture and heat of the hot water and uh, whip it down around the bottom of the canoe. Those temporary cross pieces on to uh, support the gunnels from the force of the ribs as they go in so that they don't change the 
shape of the goggles will cause them to twist. And then we'll take them off after the ribs are in before the caps go on. Most of the center, I like these are real wide piece because of the curve in the end. We bent them on the first day. They were made and soaked, uh, soaked for a week before the first day here. I put the pieces of planking. These are uh, sticks that are used to uh, spread the sides of the ribs and uh, they need to be put in order so we can find the ones we need. The bark is dried. It's dried in the shape of, of uh, a square box and we want it to be able to change shape to a rounded shape of the ribs. So we just want to keep mopping up wherever it spills through. But this is number three. And they're numbered, so um, the reason I don't go right to one is because Too tight. Yeah, it takes so much force to spread the bar. That um, happens right to right, grab right, the bark is thick, you might break it anyway, but um, this way you're trying to spread the sides out gradually. You can still see the center mark of the rib as a, as a rough guide. It's not an absolute, but because uh, you know these ribs sometimes are bent and evenly a little bit. Centering the rib, now we do it by eye after after we get first we're going to just clamp it. Generally speaking, the first uh, with the first round of ribs, which is every other rib, the odd numbered ribs, is what we're putting in first, about a quarter inch above the point where they contact the end wells when they're driven down between the clamps. Mm -hmm. The best way to cut that is across with a crooked knife, you know, just above your thumb. Use your thumb as a pry prong, but as a full prong, but of course, keep it below the point of cut, and then cut off the corners the same way. Now what you want to be most careful of when you're putting in a rib is that it doesn't snap back once it's partially under the, under the bevel mm -hmm. because it can split or chip off. we're putting first just every other rib is so that we can drive the planking down tight between them so that it will make edge-to-edge -edge contact. The total overlap is from 14 to 30 inches. That strengthens the middle section of the canoe where um, it's needed, you know, say, say if it hits a big wave or something, um, that's, where the, that's where the strain is concentrated in the, 
in, in the boat. And then the fact that, that you have the planking in two lengths potentially could be a weak point if you don't allow plenty of overlap. We're putting the cap rails on the gunnels. They're just pegged on with wooden pegs. on the side to be just wide enough to catch the edge of the cap and then the string can go back on. It's winter bark so we can decorate those. They're just clamped under the caps and the outwells so we're put flashings through and hold everything together. I'm making a couple of temporary lashings. You call it a butterfly lashing. And if you first turn this tight, it'll get loosened up later. You have to have three passes through the first hole. So the last hole is going to be three again, I think. Three as well. Temporary ones in there now that are just used as a template to make these. These are going to be bent with hot water. These are cedar. We added on the, the caps, the gunnel caps, uh, to cover the lashings and protect them. And they're just pegged on. They were just soaked um, so that they would take the bend easily. Piece of bark that goes over the ends under the caps and out whales, and then gets lashed here and here. This is a temporary lashing that will be taken out when these headboards go in. This team worked really well, and doing the final design work is really nice. I like, I like these little intricacies of the project. That fish was the, uh, the mummy chug from the DRA, and we're also putting it. DRA heron on the, the other one. It should be thin enough to uh, bend easily. These are going to be bent hopefully by the end of the day using hot water. Um, but the reason we're carving them down in the middle is because we want to leave the ends a little bit thicker where the, um, the notch is at this end and the tenon is at this end. Those are the places where it's likely to split. So we want to keep those a little bit thicker to make them stronger. The bottom of, of these big ones fit in, fit, has a notch that fits into the notch in the stem piece. And then the top has a tenon that fits up between the end wells after this temporary lashing is taken out and then a permanent one is held, is put back in in front of it. Uh, we're making one of the inside headboards. So there's two headboards that go on each end of the boat. Uh, this is the inside headboard. Since there's no ribs up in that part of the boat, it helps um, keep the, you know, the natural curve of the boat going. It's pine rosin mixed with beeswax and lard. And the beeswax and lard are to uh, keep it from being brittle. But pine rosin is the main ingredient. Potential leaks. If we don't find them now, we'll find them later, but you better find them now. It's my dad's name in Passamaquoddy, so this is kind of just like a tribute to him. Um, and we decided to carry up the stern of the boat so that anybody who uses this vessel has a master guiding their tail and watching over their journey rather than leading it. Uh, we trust that anybody who will get in this vessel uh, will have a safe journey. We are excited that this boat is seen in the light of day and it's going to make its first uh, headway on the water. Woo! Oh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> on behalf of the family and the Passamaquoddy people, we embrace each and every one of you. And what a wonderful opportunity for us to be able to experience and to be able to continue on a tradition that we've all shared. Wooly one. Thank you. Oh. Yay! Yay! Steve is, it moves like thought.